There were only a handful of Keynesians in Ottawa. Twenty years later, everyone was a Keynesian, including, I am told, Richard Nixon. At that time, there were only a few monetarists around, but they spread like mushrooms and soon dominated the economic landscape. It reached the stage where Keynes was anathema, and it was almost impossible to get a tenured position in a school of economics unless you were part of Milton Friedman's monetarist revolution. Apparently, little if any thought was given to the possibility that neither Keynes nor Friedman had got it right. The former was a bit closer to reality than the latter, but both theories foundered on the rocks of one inescapable truth. Both assumed that the economic system is self-correcting. Yet more than two centuries of experience has demonstrated clearly that it is not. Someone has to be at the tiller, charged with steering clear of the shoals and rocks of economic disaster. And that person has to be someone who is responsible to the people and not the self-governing, self-serving boom busters. While bank reform is the most urgent problem facing the world today, it is global warming that has equally or even greater long-term consequences. It is a total fraud to pretend that we have 30, 40, or 50 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There are reputable scientists who think that we have already crossed the Rubicon. Even if that is true, we can't roll the clock back. We can only influence the present and the future. Each of the past three decades has been the hottest on record. According to a report released in July 2010 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, all of the indicators are worrisome. And that included data measured by 160 research groups in 48 countries. The data shows that sea levels are rising. Snow cover in the Arctic melts earlier. The average air temperature is rising. Ocean surface temperatures have been rising also. The summer sea ice is declining. Sea air temperatures have been rising. For 19 years, glaciers have lost mass. Land air temperature has also been rising, and this is all a global trend. All of this puts the lie to the propaganda of the oil industry aimed at creating doubt about the reliability of the scientific data. Taking a leaf from the tobacco industry, which managed to create doubt about the safety of their products years after they privately knew the facts, the oil industry has been attempting to raise doubt about the urgency of replacing fossil fuels with clean energy. And with considerable success, I regret to say. In their case, however, the stakes are higher. It was a tragedy that so many people lost their lives through lack of sound information about the consequences of smoking. In the case of global warming, however, many times more people will have their lives put at risk. Still, the oil cartel is making plans as if nothing was going to change and that we are going to be stuck with a fatal oil economy for decades until the damage is irreversible. Well, let me say, <coughs> it is too late for more offshore drilling. It is too late for new developments in the Alberta oil sands. It is too late for more noisy windmill farms. The transition must start now with a 10-year deadline. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. But only with the kind of mobilization essential to win a war for survival, which is really what we're talking about. 
One excuse for inaction has been the lack of money due to government deficits and debt. But that obstacle can be overcome in less than a year if governments and legislatures change the system and exercise their sovereign right to make what is physically possible financially possible. Heaven knows there are millions of unemployed people, workers worldwide, just waiting to rise to the challenge. The other major obstacle has been a lack of consensus on the form of clean energy to use to replace the fossil fuel economy. And that brings me finally to the subject of the day, the extraterrestrial presence and technology. It is a fraud for the government to pretend that it is not interested in UFOs. In fact, as most of you know, it has been a matter of high and probably preeminent interest for decades. As Richard Dolan told us, I think it was yesterday, an early Canadian ufologist, ufologist Wilbert Smith, who was a senior employee at the Department of Transport, where I later became minister, not long uh, before I actually arrived there, wrote a top-secret memorandum to the Controller of Communications, dated November 21, 1950, asking permission to set up a group to study the geomagnetic aspects of UFOs propulsion systems. And as a part of the memorandum, Smith said that he had made discreet inquiries through the Canadian Embassy staff in Washington, and he had obtained the following information that the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. Flying saucers exist. Their modus operandi is unknown, but a concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. The entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. So, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who was one of America's preeminent scientists at the time, and a team of experts he had assembled, were already working on back engineering by 1950. Many people who are interested in the subject of UFOs uh, use one of the Roswell crashes of July 1947 as their starting line. Recent evidence, uh, however, confirms that the U.S. Army Air Corps was in the crash retrieval business even before that. Paula Harris, on July the 5th, 2010, interviewed uh, two men, Jose Padilla and Remy Baca, who were aged nine and seven at the time, who witnessed a saucer crash on Padilla land near San Antonio, New Mexico, in August of 1945. In her new book, Exopolitics, Stargate to a New Reality, Paula gives the detailed account of what these men saw as children. The actual crash, the creature's appearance, the pieces of the craft that they took, the military cleanup, and an in-depth analysis of the significance of the case. Well, I had the opportunity to chat with Remy Baca by telephone recently, and the thing that stuck in my mind was that when Sergeant Avila came to ask Mr. Padilla permission to enter his land to retrieve the object, quote-unquote, he referred to it as, quote, an experimental weather balloon. Doesn't that sound familiar? That was exactly the same ruse that Brigadier General Roger Ramey used in reference to the Roswell incident two years later. Apparently, there was a considerable lack of imagination on the Army's part. <laughs> in later, later years, the Air Force that had succeeded the Army Air Corps became much more sophisticated in its misinformation and disinformation techniques. These include having the star visitors portrayed in movies as sinister beings that we should be fearful of, probably without justification. 
Another fascinating case that uh, Paula brought to my attention not long ago was that of Charles Hall, the physicist and information technology professional who worked as an airman meteorologist at the USAF bombing and gunnery range at Indian Springs, Nevada in the 1960s. Charles worked in close contact with tall whites, a species that I had been previously unfamiliar with. And over a period of months, he learned to lose his fear of the aliens who lived, worked, and played on Air Force property. In a two-hour telephone conversation, he gave me many of the characteristics of the, uh, of the whites, described the scout ships in which they traveled around, and said most of them had been assembled in the United States. Furthermore, he talked about the mothership arriving on the nights of the full moon and sliding into its hangar cut into the side of a mountain nearby. It was all fascinating stuff that included the fact that the tall whites were working closely with the USAF and exchanging technology in the mid-1960s. So it is very difficult to imagine how much has been achieved in 60 years of back engineering. There is no doubt that myriad scientists, technicians, and many of America's most advanced aircraft and weapons corporations must have achieved what would have been classified as miracles just a few years ago. As Michael Schratt demonstrated clearly Thursday morning, that is the case. And as interesting as S-4 is, with its special uh, designation, it isn't the only installation, as you well know. There are others, and there are a lot of things that we still don't know. It is uh, probably a fact that U.S. engineers working in one of the vast underground facilities have built vehicles that are virtually indistinguishable from those of other planets. Now what we want to know is to what purpose they will be put. Will it be for good purposes or military purposes? <coughs> Could I have a little uh, glass of water, please? The area of discovery that is most relevant to this presentation, however, is the question of exotic energy sources. Years ago, it was reported that both zero-point and cold fusion energy had been developed. These are energy sources that could facilitate the 10-year target date and not only revolutionize the world for the better, <coughs> but help preserve it as a happy habitat for earthlings. It's down here, thank you. <coughs> In the unlikely event that these sources are not yet commercially viable, all we would have to do is ask one of the friendly species to help us.